So for those that aren't metabolically fit and they want to utilize caffeine in order to boost their metabolism because, you know, that is such a natural way to boost your metabolism. What happens at a physiological level when you use caffeine to boost your metabolism, you know, when you're not going and getting active and taking those walks and doing that thing? What happens? Well, I think, yeah, so you bring up a, a good, I think, like misconception. I think people think of caffeine is this magic me metabolic booster thing but like let's first maybe break down like what's happening with caffeine and what it's actually doing and then maybe cover a couple of myths so like what caffeine is doing is it's sort of mimicking this feeling of energy in the body it kind of tricks your body to think i've got more energy than i do um and so what it's doing is it's helping you feel alert it's helping with maybe a little bit of mental focus um so that's kind of where i think about caffeine there's a lot of you know, people for sports use caffeine, like they're ready, they're kind of more game time ready. Right, I, right. What, do you want to I would anything? totally agree. I think about, I'm gonna use Madison again for another example. You're like, okay, stop it. <laughs> but if she's up to bat, if you have a caffeinated beverage, like, you know, 30 minutes before you're up to bat, you're not gonna hit the ball three times as far, but you'll, as John just said, you're gonna have more focus. You'll probably have your uh, maybe increased hand-eye coordination because your, your reaction time's improved. So I don't think of it as like this super stimulant in terms of creating a tremendous amount of energy in your muscle tissue, but it gives your central nervous system a kick. So, right. and you just think about it, caffeine's consumed globally, right? Um, I mean, whether it's coffee, green tea, black tea, different types, it's such a common thing that people use, guarana in South America. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, in, it's in a lot of beverages that people use uh, and it's very common. I think that the, that's the basis of this maybe misconception is like there's probably like a momentary like blip up in mm -hmm. sort of this like basal metabolic rate, but it's relatively short and small. Right. So if you put it in the context of like movement of muscle, it's it's kind of negligible. Right. It's, but I think that's where the misconception comes from. Right. Um, totally. And as we talk about misconceptions, another misconception is that energy crash. Is that what you oh, talked about in that? Yeah, yeah. 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 So I see a lot of ads on social media. They're like, hey, like, don't get the caffeine crash. Get my product instead. And it's lasting energy or something, you know, mm -hmm. that that pitch. You know, caffeine doesn't innately cause a crash. What's what's causing the crash is like if you're masking lack of sleep and poor rest, you're gonna get this feeling of energy from the caffeine, and as the caffeine wears off, it just reveals the fact that you're tired, but it's not actually caffeine causing the crash, it's you're already at that low level. I mean, so that's a big misconception, I yeah. think, so, yeah. I would totally agree, and I would just add that, look, you know, I was, saying, I was trying to set the, the tone by saying caffeine's consumed by pi millions of people around the world, I mean, billions, it's, I think, I think tea and coffee are probably the, with water, tea, and coffee are the most consumed beverages probably on, on the earth. But it's it, there's not a problem with caffeine, you know? I enjoy having caffeinated beverages, but I think to your point, Madison, it's not going to, you know, create some kind of magic. It works through these physiologic functions. It, it, it helps support the body in different ways. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, it could be delicious in your coffee, tea, or, or energy drink, whatever yeah. you have. Yeah. Which basically brings me to also asking, is there such thing as too much if we can enjoy it as much as we do? How much caffeine is too much and does that affect us negatively physiologically? Yeah, absolutely. I think, and you go to any country, I think generally the 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 folks who are in charge of the health ministers and you know the, these agencies will generally set um, healthy ranges for caffeine consumption. Because it's really kind of a point of, you know, I, I, when I was in school, some of the professors would tell me, you have one slice of pizza, it tastes really good. You have three slices of pizza, it's still pretty good. There's a, there's a law of diminishing returns. If you eat a whole pizza, you're just not really enjoying it. It's really not doing what like the pizza's supposed to be. You're supposed to enjoy it, right? So caffeine consumption is kind of a law of diminishing returns. It's gonna help you stimulate the central nervous system, like John said, but at a point, you don't need a lot more because it's just gonna make you a little jittery and maybe nervous. And So it's not really helping. It's not a dose-dependent response. So we have recommendations generally in most countries where we're training and teaching. You don't want to have more than, let's say, 200 milligrams per sitting. And then we're really not going to have more than 400 milligrams in a day. That's generally general recommendation. So I think just a, I think in terms of milligrams, I think in terms of putting it in context, like 
two cups of coffee back to back is, is kind of a level or maybe like two strong teas or something, you know, so then it's like twice a day, yeah. like, right. So that's kind of like, I think a bounce, like an energy drink, a strong energy drink might be 200 migs in one can. Right. So like two cans a day. I think the other interesting thing is caffeine sensitivity. It's like highly habitual, meaning like you get used to it real quick. Like it's, it's, you know, it's a chemical, chemical, you know, chemicals that are formed in the body we learn to metabolize them. So like there's people that are more easily able to metabolize higher caffeine. So someone that's like, doesn't get a lot of caffeine, they get a high dose weight. Then that's where you start to get, you know, increased heart rate and some of these negative effects. Yeah. yeah. And John, you made a great point about habituation, like sort of when people are, you know, you get used to drinking coffee or tea or energy drinks. So the body gets used to it, but it is important to point out that some folks are caffeine sensitive. So John was mentioning the amounts, let's say the 200 milligrams per sitting or 400 milligrams in one in one day. It's kind of the recommended amounts. Some folks may need to dial that way down because they're very sensitive. So sh people should be careful. So I think uh, important point, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, I mean, important point there, like I, I, for myself, I don't know if I have like a caffeine sensitivity gene, but like I try not to have caffeine like after noon because like I just know it kind of like impacts my sleep a little for bit. For sure. So, yeah. you know, I try to be mindful of the sensitivity factor there. No, that's a great point. Yeah, that's definitely something people talk about is caffeine impacting sleep. Do you guys think that that is certainly something that happens after a certain time during the day? Absolutely, I know John, John, you know, is our one of our resident sleep experts, um, having done research in that area. But obviously, if it's like we said earlier, stimulating the central nervous system, whether it's hitting a softball or just being alert, that means you're not going to be able to fall asleep right away. So generally, and John, you may have some recommendations of the the amount of hours you would want to stop your caffeine consumption before you're actually hitting the pillow. Well, I think one of the things that like people don't fully grasp on the caffeine is like they might be like, well, I feel like I got a good night of sleep, so it's not impacting me. Mm. But even at like a deeper level, just because you're asleep doesn't you mean you're getting quality yeah, sleep. So you might be in this like light sleep stage, but you don't actually enter into like the slow wave or deep sleep. It's restorative. So, for sure. So if you're wearing like some maybe fitness tracker, it might give you some indication on that. But for me, the effect I feel is like, I feel like that mind racing. If I mm. have caffeine after noon, it's just a little bit hard for me. And like, that's, I always know, like if I have that caffeine at 2 PM, I'm like, I know I'm going to feel it later. And it's just like a little bit challenging to fall asleep. So that's kind of like my gauge, but also like the quality of sleep. So I, I would just caution people, even though you think you're getting sleep, you may not be getting the quality sleep that you really need if you're having caffeine too late. So that's kind of the watch out. Yeah, makes sense. Maybe like what we'd say five, six hours is like a comfortable buffer or even or so, some folks who are caffeine sensitive even more, right? I mean, you know, like 3 p.m. I feel like is a, should be a hard cutoff for most right. people. Like, you know, if I'd agree noon that, pushing yeah. it closer to noon, you know, yeah. so something in there. Definitely like, don't want to have a shot of espresso like, you know, at 9 p.m. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and speaking of that shot of espresso, yeah. do you think that coffee or espresso or tea or these things dehydrate you because i know that if you take that shot of espresso you will feel that dehydration but is that the same thing with coffee or that or do you even feel that a lot of people think that that might have something to do with you know their their mm. bad sleep or things like that too like oh i was dehydrated and i didn't get enough liquids in do you guys think that it does dehydrate you yeah, and I think John was touching on it. He mentioned habituation. Basically, caffeine is a diuretic, so it, it makes the body go to the bathroom. You void, right, fluids. But, but to his point about habituation, if I regularly drink tea or coffee or energy drinks, then my body gets used to it. And because there's fluid in the coffee, tea, energy drinks, to your point, um, you're, it's really not going to have a significant impact. So yeah, by definition, caffeine is a diuretic, but it's really not going to affect, let's say, you, Madison, as an athlete, John as an an endurance cyclist and runner, it's not going to affect your performance if you're having some tea, some coffee, some energy drinks. What do you think, John? Yeah, I think like the caffeine, the compound is diuretic, but when you're drinking coffee or tea or an energy drink, there's water in it. So right. it's actually net hydrating. Mm -hmm. But to your point, if you had a shot of espresso, there's not as much volume. So maybe it's slightly dehydrating, but like I wouldn't think about a cup of coffee as being dehydrating. So same way. Yeah. Yep. So. Yeah. Wow. Well, this has been great, guys. I'm so excited about this conversation. There's so much value in here. And I think we touched on a lot of things that we're also going to mention in episode three. So if you ever felt tired after meals or if you'd struggle with cravings or if you have struggled with blood sugar and questions of what can spike that, stay tuned for episode three.